So with that, I'll just um, turn it back to you and um, would love to hear questions or answer um, any concerns and um, have a conversation about this topic. Okay. Should I pull jump and just, uh... Yes, thank you very much, Jane, for your presentation. And we have uh, one question from Ashenur and also from Yunus Emre Kaya. And Ashenur asked that, do you believe that today's non-governmental uh, organizations have begun to supplant the government or political parties? That they're going to supplant them? Yes, supplant. Well, you know, I don't, I think obviously it's going to vary by the organization. I think that what we need is uh, collaboration amongst all the sectors. I think the government plays a very important role. I think the NGO sector plays a important, very important role and the private sector plays a very important role and they all bring different resources and expertise to the problem. So I don't think it's a matter of, um, dominance of, oh, this sector is going to solve all the problems. I, I think that people are turning to the nonprofit sector more because I think there's quite a bit of frustration and perhaps disillusionment in what the government is capable of doing effectively and solving social problems. I think we as societies have seen so many ills and challenges, um, environmental and social, kind of get away from us where they're so desperate and so dire that we're looking to somebody else to help solve the problem. And I think certainly the NGO sector has grown dramatically over the past several decades. So there's that, that view that of course the NGO sector is becoming more dominant, but I think in reality, we have to see the value in what everybody's bringing and be able to build those connections and build the culture in each of those sectors to be able to work in this way that I'm describing so that they can work effectively together. So I don't think we can dispense with any sector. And I think everyone's important and we need to then find new ways of working together to get the change that we're looking for. Thank you very much. And also we have another question from Yunus Emre Kaya. And uh, how can we differentiate ourselves as an organization while respecting to these principles since being a bright brand also has its own advantages to access resources and greater impact? Yes, absolutely. And that's a very good point and I'm glad it was raised. So thank you for that. I think it, it is definitely a balancing act. So for example, some of the cases that I've looked at, um, what they'll do is in, the, in certain contexts, so for example, with their own funders, the nonprofit will self-promote like crazy. In fact, that's a quote from one of the foundations that I've looked at where um, they focus on climate change and the Energy Foundation said, when the time is, is right and it's the correct context, we will say all of the great things that we've done and all the things that we have actually contributed to. But then there are other instances where, for example, with Energy Foundation, again, where there was um, clean air restrictions for vehicle emissions passed in California many, many years ago. Um, and um, there was an opportunity to stand behind the California governor. Back then, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the Energy Foundation president had the opportunity to stand behind him when this bill was being signed. But he said, you know, this isn't really an opportunity that's that important to me. We're not in the, the retail end of um, advocacy. We are actually an intermediary. We fund nonprofits that advocate for clean energy policy. So why don't we have one of our grantees, one of our network members, be in that position when the legislation is being signed and let them get the recognition and let the fundraising dollars go to them because we don't need that type of recognition. So again, in front of their own fundraising opportunities when it's um, important with high net worth individuals that donate to Energy Foundation, they are very clear in articulating what they do and what they are, where they're adding value. But where it was an opportunity to get uh, support from the public and get support from uh, peers in the community, they said, we don't need that, that opportunity. We'll give it to someone else in our network where they can benefit from that. 
And the other thing that I've seen is that you can also build a reputation for being someone that plays well with others in the sandbox. That being a very good network leader, not because you've said you're a great network leader, but because other people are saying, that person is so well connected. They're so good at working with other organizations. They're so charismatic or dynamic that they can engage people to help on, on the mission, even in unexpected ways. We want to work with them. That type of ability can bring in more resources. So I've seen in many instances where the resources coming into the network are actually increased because of the leaders and the the network's approach to solving the problem. Because most people at this stage, especially because there's been so much frustration on limited impact in the field of social impact work, people want other want to invest in organizations that collaborate well. And so if you can say, we do this work and we contribute and add value in this way, but we also bring along five or 10 other players that are aligned with what we do that add value and complement what we do. And there are synergies that are being achieved because of it. That can attract a lot more attention than just saying what you do well. And of course, those network partners, if they value your relationship and they see that value you're adding, they'll sing your praises and promote you to other people. And I can tell you, someone else promoting and saying the wonderful things about you is much more compelling than you saying great things about yourself. Certainly, I've, I've seen that um, in many cases, and that happens where network members praise their peers and that brings in more resources for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And also we have another question from Mehmet. How can the importance of leadership be mobilized when societies have the carelessness of today? Sorry, the, how, can, how can we mobilize how this can kind the, of leadership? Yes, important, importance of leadership be mobilized societies when societies have the carelessness of today. Um, so just that this leadership approach isn't widely practiced, I know. And how can we get more of it given that mm -hmm. there's maybe careless leadership in the, in the world today? So mm -hmm. I think the best way to do this, and this is certainly what I've been doing in my own work, is sharing examples of great leadership, lifting up examples where we see this type of very visionary network leadership happening. And that's certainly what I've made a career doing is lifting up these unsung heroes of people who have focused on a very, very ambitious goal, but they get to that goal and get to that mission impact, not just through themselves and their own sheer um, organizational will, but again, by bringing others along and getting to that mission impact. So, so often these types of leaders are comfortable being behind the scenes and they don't really want the spotlight. And I'm not saying that we make them uncomfortable, but I think we can lift up the work and lift up, look at what was accomplished because people worked in this way, because they didn't try to be so competitive that they actually were hindering the ability of the collaborative to work. Look at what was achieved again with Habitat Egypt. They became one of the world's most successful Habitat country programs by cumulative house numbers, by highest repayment rates. Within a few years of starting their network and building in this way, even though some of their peers had been working in the field for decades. And again, lifting up that example of them working with the community and building the capacity in the field, that's the type of example that can inspire people to let go of traditional ways of working and say, oh, maybe it's worth the risk because the truth is, if we hold on to power, hold on to resources and try to run the entire show and we're only getting incremental change and yet we see all of these other examples of people who've worked through networks and worked with trusted partners and let go of control and let go of some of the resources. As for example, with some of these networks, I've seen network members suggest a donor give money to their competitor and say, you know, we're, we're not the best person to do that. You should give the money to our peer. It's, it's going to be better used that way. So to see that type of behavior and lift it up, that's where we can start to get more and more leadership that emulates and models this approach. So that's why I love sharing stories. I love hearing more examples of 
where people have done this because I know this type of leadership is happening all over the world and every community, but it's not looked for. We don't go out of our way to find it. And I'd love for everybody who's on this call and certainly um, my goal in sharing my research is to share the model so that other people can know what to look for in their own communities. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And we have another question from Saadettin Avdilar. Uh, the values are completely different values in organization in Eastern cultures. How will you change this view? Yeah, well, I think it's true. The values are perhaps more attuned to a more communal um, culture. So Eastern cultures tend to be more community minded, whereas where I am in the US, it's much more independent uh, minded. But at the same time, I think if you look at most institutions, whether um, private sector, government or nonprofit, there's a tendency for those institutions to take on a life of their own, where then those institutions and the people at the helm want more power and more resources and want to be able to affect change through their organizations. And um, we have to kind of break some old habits that drive toward, again, that command and control hierarchical approach that then allow for more trust-based, relational, community-based ways of solving problems. So I wouldn't argue that some cultures are going to be more open to this way of working, but I think in every culture, you're still going to have that um, more organization-centric way of working once you get people working in institutions and their silos and people aren't looking outside of their immediate chain of command to see how they might affect change by working alongside others. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Um, but I do think there's opportunity to apply this thinking in many contexts, regardless of the cultural differences. And also we have another question from Yunus Emre. Uh, we have discussed great points about enti entitled organizations, but what would you recommend for newly entering organizations or people to impact creating sector while there are giant private corporations against you? Yes, well, I think when you're trying to make the change and say you're a small fledgling new organization, then it becomes even more urgent to work in this way. Because as you know, as a small entity, you can only do so much. But if you engage with five, 10, a dozen or dozens of other organizations that are also aligned with you on that cause, you're going to be able to make more of an impact and get the attention of a large corporation where you might not if you were just a single entity working alone. So if anything, the demand for working that way is even greater when you're just starting out. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question from Mehmet. How should we explain to people who think that you are leading by wearing beautiful shoes, not only by wearing nice shoes, without technical knowledge, they are going the wrong way? Yeah, Sorry, I, I, I don't understand the question exactly. Yeah, um, how should we explain to people who think that you are leading by wearing beautiful shoes, only by wearing nice shoes, without technical knowledge, they are going the wrong way? Well, I think certainly people who are working in this way have to not only talk about working in this way, but they have to show through their actions and their behaviors and demonstrate through those, their commitment to, to working in this way. So all of these principles of network leadership, I think they all sound nice. It's easy to say, oh yes, we focus on mission and we're very humble and we trust our partners. But in reality, I think many of us know when we've worked in organizations and worked in partnerships, those norms aren't always the dominant norms. And so the way that you go beyond just talking 
in, in network terms is really showing your commitment through your actions. So is your, is your strategy, are the decisions you're making really showing your commitment to really investing in the network or are they really still more self-interested and um, less network minded than they should be. So it's really important that there's a consistency between the wonderful talk and aspiration for community and collaboration. And again, the commitment to it, through your day-to-day -day work and the way that you treat others and the way that you work with other people. So in many ways, I, I think that this approach that I'm talking about, it's really basic and intuitive. It's the golden rule, treat people the way that you want to be treated. Again, so often I see in the nonprofit sector, those with resources, particularly financial resources, tell other people what to do and say, you must do X, Y, and Z. And because we have the money, you must behave in this way and you must deliver this. And we are, we are the experts, we have all the answers. But the reality is there's no single person or organization that has all the good ideas. And there's no single smartest person in the room. And so valuing the expertise and the knowledge and the relationships, whatever the resources might be, valuing, valuing those things of amongst your peers equally with financial resources is absolutely in, imperative. And that's something, again, I think we have to break a habit around that we can't just say, well, whoever has the money gets to call all the shots. And I think, um, again, going back to the previous uh, question, so often I think institutions across all cultures, when they have power and they have resources, they have a tendency to think that they are the smartest person or smartest organization and should dictate how decisions are made for the best of the community. But that's not always the case. For sure. Okay, and we have another question from Shebna. Do we need mostly a celebrity to make better public relations for nonprofit organizations for high level of donations? Um, I think, again, I've seen a lot of networks who have gotten recognition for the impact that they've had, not through celebrity, but because they are doing work that's making a difference. So once you start to get the benefits of the network from working together as a community on, on the ground, you don't really need a celebrity spokesperson. I, I don't think that that's necessary at all with a networked approach. In fact, I think what I see is, again, a network leadership approach is focused more on humility and not getting the recognition. It's about building up a community of actors who are beginning to solve problems for themselves in their own um, communities. So it's less about an outsider who has a big has prominence or recognition to bring that attention. It's saying, let's tap into what expertise and what resources we have in our communities. Let's build greater relationships, stronger relationships and greater connections amongst those various players who have those resources. And let's see what we can do together as a community. So I think that um, the celebrity spokesperson isn't at all necessary. And in fact, could potentially be detrimental if the celebrity themselves does not demonstrate a commitment to this way of leading or this set of values. Um, that makes sense. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, oh yeah, uh, excuse me. And we have the last question and I want the Ashenur to ask the question herself. <laughs> Ashenur, you can ask the question to Jane. Oh no, she doesn't listen to us. Okay, Ashenur asked a question because of the pandemic, everything is now in the virtu virtual world and in the virtual world, how can a trust-based relationship be established? Yes, and that's a great question. Well, I think a couple mm -hmm. of things. One is that um, I guess in the context of the pandemic, I think there's a really big opportunity for us to begin to think about working in different ways. So as we all know, a crisis situation can often break us of old habits because we're willing to take a risk and say, what do we need to do to address this crisis? 
Um, so there are more and more opportunities, I believe, for collaboration to help each other and come together as a community and address the problems that we're facing. So that's the good news. It's true, I think virtual meetings are not necessarily the most conducive to building a trust-based relationship, but it certainly can be done in the sense that say, when we have a meeting such as this, um, I sometimes lead workshops where we do small breakout groups of say five or six people, and then they have a, a conversation or we have a conversation amongst ourselves of um, a facilitated curated question. It might be something like, what is something that you're most proud of in your work? Or what is something that you're struggling in your work that you could really get help on? Or what is some expertise that you have that you would like to share with others? So again, you have smaller conversations within the context of a virtual meeting. And then even if you haven't met these people for face to face, you have a conversation around more meaningful questions that gives you a chance to engage authentically and get to know each other that even if you haven't met in person or maybe months or years even before you meet in person, it is possible to establish that. It's more taking the time to say, let's not just focus on the work and not focus on building relationships. Let's take time out of every meeting, even if it's five or 10 minutes to check in, find out what's the top of mind, what's um, concerning you, um, how are you feeling today, whatever the case might be. And there's countless questions you could ask um, a small group to talk about that would get them more connected. What's a favorite book? What's a favorite place? What's Where do you love to travel and why? Um, those types of things let us kind of get out of our shell and get out of our day-to-day -day formal roles and say, I'm a human being just like you are and I'd love to know more about you. And that connectivity can then make it easier and more effective and more efficient when you do have conversations about work that are difficult or contentious or there may be disagreement because you've made a foundation of trust and openness that that can make you be able to overcome that more readily because you've invested that time. Okay, so. Oh. Can you unmute it? We cannot hear you. Sorry about that. Okay, so let me just take a few minutes to wrap up and share some final thoughts. So the, if, if you've learned anything from our conversation today, I hope it's just that you can think about a shift from the typical way of being in organizations to, um, a more networked way of being in organizations that again, you don't have to take on all of the burdens yourself. In fact, there are others out there who might be sharing the same problem that might be able to help you and you might be able to help them and you might be able to come up with something more productive and more efficient and more sustainable because you've gotten the um, connection and the working relationship with each other. And I'll just share a quote that I love, that I think um, is quite descriptive of this way of working, um, that the leader is best when people barely know he exists, that when the work is done, people will say we they did it themselves. And again, it goes back to this whole idea of it's not about the recognition or the control or the power, but much more about our, at the end of the day, are we getting the mission accomplished? And if we do that, that is reward in and of itself. And that's the way that we together as a community, as a global community can solve the problems that we all face together. Thank you so much. Uh, Jane, um, many thanks. Let's, let's ask, maybe someone ha uh, wants to ask questions uh, by raising their hands or they might want to ask a video question, they, want, they might want to talk. So now uh, anyone who is raising the hand, just, uh, you, can, you can just, uh, please. Uh... I want to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> if possible. And um, yes. oh, we as a LinkedIn group, you know, uh, Dayanışma Otililer, uh, we are organizing some activities and I'm, uh, we, we have speaking club, free, uh, free speaking club, but what else can we do to attract, you know, more participants and to be much more active group? Do you have any yeah, well, suggestions for us? <laughs> yeah, I think, again, an opportunity for people to get to know one another in small groups 
again, facilitated. So for example, it could just be um, that it's not focused on speaking per se, but let's get together and then we'll break you out in small groups and then you'll have a chance in your small groups to just have some meaningful conversations with each other for 20 minutes or something. And I think all of us, we are as human beings, hardwired to seek connections with each other, social connections, meaningful connections. So the more you offer to people that opportunity, again, that sense of community, people are drawn to that. Again, we've had so many Zoom meetings that are just talking about work and we kind of keep our more formal roles and talk about our professional goals, but we don't have the chance to necessarily connect with each other as we might with our friends or with our family. But I can assure you, I've done this in so many workshops now through my work in promoting network leadership is that if you take the time to invest in just connections with each other as human beings on virtually any topic, as I was uh, describing before, that can make um, a world of difference in the way that people want to engage. It just almost kind of lifts a burden or lifts a stress that people feel like they're listened to, that they're being heard and they can share mutually um, that shared experience, whatever it might be. It could be what was the most impactful year of your life? What was the most important mentor in your um, career or your education so far? And talk about that. And what we see is that no matter how diverse the group, and I've done this with very diverse groups, that people will say, wow, I, from, from the appearances, I thought I had nothing in common with these people or with that person. But in sharing our com in our conversation, I realized we had such a shared experience. I've had that happen in some of the workshops that I've led. And it's really um, refreshing to have the chance to engage with each other that way. So I think um, in your group, giving participants in every meeting a chance to connect in that way, even if it's just five minutes, 10 minutes each time, if you have more content that you need to present, um, that may help to um, strengthen the relationships amongst the attendees. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Jane, I, I have a question. Maybe uh, uh, it is a good idea to think about like um, advertising that, uh, let's say you are a network or a group that you want to collaborate. So you, you, you might want to just uh, advertise this uh, in a way and just, so what might be a good way uh, to do that? Maybe you have some you know, thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I think for first, I think people should not be um, overwhelmed by this idea, oh, you have to build this giant network and get everybody on board and you're gonna spend all your time coordinating this. It can just start with one or two people that you know in your professional or educational or um, social circles that you have a connection with that you know or you're getting to know that you build that trust and you start to see, oh, maybe we can talk about some of our work challenges or maybe we can help each other with this or that. And just small um, connections and investing in the ones that are re already potentially promising and then seeing where we might be able to connect and support each other in our work. Um, so it's not necessarily that you have to get a large group together, but just starting to invest in those relationships that you already do have and broaden the um, possibilities of those relationships is a way to start. Because a lot of the networks that I've studied, they weren't deliberate about it in the sense that they advertised to the whole field and said, we want to collaborate, now come talk to us. It was much more, there was one or two trusted people that they knew, peers, or sometimes even leaders that were of competing organizations. And they said, we're facing a lot of the same challenges. How can we help each other? And the CEOs got to know each other and started to see, oh, we have a common path. And in fact, we can be stronger together. And maybe we can attract more resources if we work together. And I have a certain skill set that you don't have. And you have a certain set of skills that I don't have. And so we have those synergies that we can actually affect greater change if we work together. So starting to work together at a, at a very limited level. So some nonprofits, for example, have said, you know, we could even um, 
purchase a software package together because it's going, we'll get a volume discount because maybe there are two small shops that they can't even get um, some of those volume discounts. They do very limited things initially and then start to see, oh, that was really helpful. Let's see if there's other ways now that we've done that together that we can start working together and building up little by little to see other opportunities as you start to invest in those partnerships, they'll start to snowball and you'll start to see other opportunities that you might not have anticipated if you hadn't invested in that way initially. And maybe we should ask uh, anyone who, who wants to ask questions by raising their hand uh, and asking a video question. If, uh, let me see who is raising. I see no one, so maybe we can check our uh, admins uh, if they want to say and ask question. Antamo John. No. We can have a picture I'm together. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, okay, I think uh, there's no, no more questions. Uh, if you like, uh, we can just, uh, as uh, you said, Jane, uh, we can wrap up. Uh, one, one important thing, uh, please uh, remember to open your LinkedIn group notifications. LinkedIn groups are effective when you open notifications. Otherwise, really just, it's really, uh, not so effective. Please remember to open those notifications. They are very important. Whatever you are, I mean, uh, you might be in for up to 100 uh, groups. Okay. If you open them, then really you receive good information. So and up to date and just yeah, you really become um, a network. This is my, let's say, uh, LinkedIn, uh, because we're, you know, we have a large LinkedIn group. Uh, just as per experience, I wanted to share. And um, uh, anyone from the admin group who wants to say like uh, some uh, last words before we close? Any closing remarks? So let me check one more time. And yes, uh, Jane, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Really, we appreciate uh, you, you yeah. just uh, really join and really we love this session. And really just um, uh, let's keep going. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity and feel free to take a look at uh, my website. It has case studies and videos and podcasts and articles that I've published on this way of working. Um, and I hope that it will be helpful to you because I truly have been so inspired by seeing all of these examples in my research of people getting great mission impact by working in this way and hope that someday you'll be able to see that in your own work as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.